This man accidentally recorded himself murdering a man on a voicemail. 33-year-old Cody Wade from Indiana has just been sentenced to 85 years in prison. On June the 18th, 2020, Cody left a barbecue and walked to his mother's house. He apparently stopped off at a man's house en route, telling him he was just about to kill someone. He then stabbed his own stepdad, 53-year-old Carl Haviland, four times. The shocking incident actually took place in front of his own horrified mother. He may have actually gotten away with this if it wasn't for leaving a voicemail for his mom just prior. He accidentally failed to hang the voicemail up and therefore recorded the entire brutal attack via phone. At the time of the incident, he was already on parole for arson. These are pictures with the most disturbing backstories, part four. Okay, here we have this picture. And the man shown here is just a chef cooking some food. But a little while later, he tosses his head into the fryer, completely deep frying his entire head with oil and dying. And the most messed up part about this is that there's a video of it. Apparently the man was possessed by some sort of ghost or demon, or he had some sort of mental illness, which was even noticed by some of his co-workers. But in the video, the man rotates his head extremely weirdly and inhumane, and just throws his head into the deep fryer with no hesitation, leading people to believe that he was possessed. Because why else would any sane person just throw their head into deep frying oil? I don't recommend anybody watching or searching up the video because it is pretty disturbing. Mainly because it just comes out of nowhere. One minute the chef is just cooking food doing his job, and the next he starts twisting his head all weirdly and throws his head into the deep frying oil. I will probably never watch it again and you should never. That 70s show actor Danny Masterson has got 30 years in prison for aring women. Most allegations against Danny came to light in March 2017. It was confirmed that an investigation had begun into SA involving the actor. Danny was removed from the Netflix show The Ranch and was dropped by his talent agency. He was charged in 2020 with forcibly aring three women in separate incidents between 2001 and 2003. He pleaded not guilty to three charges in January 2021. All of the crimes are believed to have taken place in his home. He was initially tried for the allegations in late 2022, but this was a mistrial and he was retried. He's now been found guilty and has been sentenced to 30 years to life. These are videos you need to see before you die. Okay, we all know how dangerous bears are and we never want to encounter them. But the video I'm about to show you shows a hiker in the woods who was just enjoying his time when suddenly a bear came out of nowhere and started attacking him. And the crazy thing is the man fought it off, but only by pure luck. If the man was in virtually any other location than he was, he was 100% dead. Next up, I know most of you guys hate snakes, but the ones that don't, this video would definitely make you hate them. The video I'm about to show you shows a snake with his head cut off, biting his own body, and it's kind of insane. This woman allegedly shot her husband when he asked for a divorce. Christina Pasqualetto from Arizona had apparently been trying to save her marriage. It may be a little bit more difficult now. On the 20th of September, the 62-year-old woman allegedly drove to the home that she shared with her estranged husband, John. She reportedly drove around about midnight and the pair got into an argument over their marriage. John told her that he wanted a divorce, whereas she did not. At this point, John said that he was in bed and Christina allegedly pulled out a weapon and shot him. The 80-year-old was able to defend himself and knock her down so that the gun fell out of her hand. He was luckily then able to flee, ran to the neighbor's house and get them to call the police. Police raced round and found John with a gunshot wound to his wrist. He was taken to a local hospital for treatment. Now, John alleges that he changed the locks of the house before the incident, but had noticed items from the house going missing. John accuses Christina of forging a check from him for $10,000. She has admitted to forgery and theft. She has been charged for this and also for attempted first degree murder and aggravated assault. One attorney said that this man is one of the most dangerous criminals ever. 
This case is absolutely horrendous. Mary Sisk was about to start a PhD. She had four young children with her husband, John, and their family was excited to meet six month old baby Colson. However, tragically, the first time their family would meet the little baby was when he was in a casket. 14 year old Mason Sisk lived in the family home along with the siblings aged six, four and six months. John was Mason's dad and Mary was his stepmom. Mason took a dislike to Mary, however, and once even attempted to poison her. He knew she had a severe peanut allergy and he attempted to lace her drink with peanut. That having failed on September the 2nd, 2019, the unthinkable happened. A hideous massacre would take the lives of all but one family member. Gunshots could be heard as Mason callously shot all of the family members as they slept in their beds. When asked what the motive for the killing was, he stated, they argue a lot and I got fed up with it. The judge wrote that the crime was ghastly, disturbing and draped in unmitigated evil. Now 18 years old, Mason has been sentenced to life in prison. Honestly seems to me like this is another case of a woman failed by the police. So Habiba Masson was actually out on bail after threatening to kill this woman. West Yorkshire Police have now referred themselves to the Independent Office for Police Conduct because this victim had contacted them about this man. He'd threatened to kill her before and he was out on bail and he actually went through with those threats. Thankfully, they did manage to track him down in Aylesbury at early hours of this morning and he has been arrested, thankfully. There was also another man, a 23-year-old, that was arrested for assisting an offender. So it sounds like somebody has been hiding him. It's also come out that he was some sort of aspiring influencer on social media. He regularly posted on YouTube and TikTok. One video, sickeningly, is him putting a crib together for a baby. I say sickeningly because he carried out this murder in front of their baby boy. I just hope that he's young enough to have not had a clue what was going on. It has been stated that the baby is safe and he wasn't harmed in the incident. I just hope the judge does the right thing now and gives him life without parole. Although in this country, it's extremely unlikely. These two men stole an airplane and then flew into the sunset never to be seen again. The two men's names are John Padilla and Ben Mutantu. And in 2003, these two men would steal a Boeing 727 somehow from the Luanda airport. Ben was an engineer and a pilot and John was a hired mechanic. It should also be noted that neither of these men were certified to fly a Boeing 727. It is believed that Ben was flying the plane, but they didn't say anything on the runway. Air traffic control was trying to contact them, but they had no luck. The two men didn't let the tower know anything and they just pulled into the runway and took off into the sky. They headed southwest over the Atlantic Ocean and disappeared completely. The airplane was filled up with 14,000 gallons of fuel which is more than 1,500 miles of flying. No debris from the plane has ever been found and the two men have also never been found. None of their clothes were ever found, their body parts were never found, and their identification was never found. This is definitely the greatest mystery in aviation history because where in the world did the plane go and where did the two men go? This might actually be a bigger mystery than Malaysia Flight 370, which is regarded as the biggest aviation mystery of all time. Austin Walsh was a 23-year-old Florida deputy who was just shot and killed by his fellow deputy roommate. Austin was a deputy with the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. He lived in Palm Bay, Florida with 22-year-old Andrew Lawson. Andrew was also a deputy with the Brevard County Sheriff's Office, and the two were described as best friends. On December 3rd, the two were at home and had spent the night playing Call of Duty together. Just after midnight, Andrew went into his bedroom and pulled out his 9mm semi-automatic pistol. According to him, he then jokingly pointed the gun at Austin, who was standing in the doorway. Andrew stated that he thought the gun was unloaded and he pulled the trigger twice. The first time nothing happened, but the second time the gun fired and hit Austin below his right eye. Austin died instantly as a result. Andrew then called 911 and told them what happened. He was then arrested and charged with manslaughter. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement and the Palm Bay Police Department are investigating the matter, but authorities have said that Andrew is fully cooperative. He's scheduled to appear in court on January 5th. So far, authorities have not confirmed if the weapon used in the killing was issued by the sheriff's office. Austin had worked with the department since he was 18, first as a public safety officer and then advancing to his dream job, which was a deputy. He was also a member of the agency's Explorer program, which teaches young people about law enforcement.
There's obviously weird things that people see in the Appalachian Mountains. People say skinwalkers, wendigos. I don't know if you know what a wendigo is. Yeah, I do. So you know yeah. how it looks like? I don't know how it looks like, but I know that they have so much hunger that it can't be satisfied. Specifically for human flesh that it can't be satisfied. The concept of a wendigo comes from a different indigenous groups in North America. The stories that, that were told from them are completely different from what we've seen nowadays. Although the depiction of the wendigo is accurate in the sense of there were once humans who had turned into cannibals and it's more or also transformation of the soul basically lose your humanity their skin would become gray they would have no lips they would have cuts on their bodies they had gone emaciated faces and the smell of rotting flesh would linger because of their skin their skin would be deteriorating to the point where you could see their bones it didn't matter who they would eat they would eat a family member or friend as long as it satisfied their needs and then why they decided to eat humans if you were a hunter and you had no animal to eat or if it was winter time there was barely any animals to catch they were resort to eating human flesh oh. and then from then on you will get banished from your tribe this is what people think a wendigo looks like that you probably have seen before oh times. yeah i seen that that's how a wendigo is supposed to look like yeah, yeah i know the game until dawn they did like a really really good accurate depiction of what a wendigo is these are the scariest japanese urban legends part one this is tiki tiki who is a japanese ghost demon she lost the lower half of her body by jumping off a train, and she was then cut in half by the oncoming train. Her name comes from the sound she makes as she's pursuing victims, as she's running across the ground using her hands. There is no way to defeat or get away from Tiki Tiki, mainly because she's a demonic spirit and is also insanely fast on her hands. Her powers include superhuman speed and strength, stealth, and even possession. Her only goal is to kill anybody who comes in her path and cut them in half. So whatever you do, hope you never see Tiki Tiki, because if you do, you're most likely going to die. This is Anaka-san, and she died in her school bathroom in the third stall. And now her spirit resides in there. She's extremely demonic and sinister, and is often compared to Bloody Mary. You can actually summon Hanaka-san, and all you have to do, go into a girl's bathroom and knock three times, and ask if Hanaka-san is there. And if she is, Hanaka-san will then drag you down to hell, and either eat you or have you suffer in hell for eternity. Her powers include invisibility, teleportation, and levitation. And her main hobby is to kill anybody who tries to summon her. So whatever you do, never try to summon Hanaka-san because you will most likely get hurt or killed. Have you ever heard of the Sunderland Strangler? Stephen Greveson is a lesser known serial killer from Sunderland in the UK. He was active during the 1990s. Shockingly, he was known to lure young boys into abandoned buildings and kill them and did so to four teenagers between 1990 and 94. In November 1993, he lured 18-year-old Thomas Kelly to an abandoned allotment shed. He killed him and then set him on fire. On the 4th of February the following year, he murdered 15-year-old David Hansen. Later that month, he would go on to lure 15-year-old David Grief to the same spot that he killed Thomas. Again, he killed him and set him on fire. All three boys attended Monk Wearmouth Academy. Now, Stephen was initially arrested in March and charged with attempted burglary at the house where he'd killed David Hansen. He was eventually charged in November 1995 with those three murders. He was given 35 years in prison. In November 2000, while in prison, he was arrested again. He was questioned over the 1990 murder of 14-year-old Simon Martin. Simon had been murdered in Gillside House in Roca. It took 12 years until he was eventually charged with this crime, and in 2013, he admitted being responsible. He was convicted of that murder in October 2013. This is what it looks like being inside of a nuclear explosion. This is absolutely crazy, so just watch. <laughs>
This Christian school teacher turned out to be one of the most hardcore pedophiles in the state of Florida, and his fall from grace really needs to be studied. This is 69-year-old Stephen Robb, and in 2022, Stephen decided to upload CP or CSAM to one of his email addresses. Stephen had been a longtime teacher at the Grace Community Church in Florida, and something I should add in here is that this church is openly outspoken against gay and LGBTQ plus students. In the same year that Stephen was arrested, the school said that gay and transgender students will be asked to leave. I find it a bit hypocritical then that one of their head teachers was arrested for being a pedophile. So after this anonymous tip came through, investigators got warrants and searched Stephen's devices. That's when they found all the CP images and videos that he had uploaded and collected. And eerily, he even had photos of a student that was fully clothed from his school. I mean, this is truly some disgusting stuff. This guy has been entrusted by his community to care for children almost every day of the week. And he puts on a mask at work. He masquerades as a Christian man with good values, who cares for families, loves God. But when he goes home at night, that's when he turns into the demonic pedophile. I don't know. It's just really disturbing how many teachers have been arrested for crimes like this recently. And I don't even know how to begin to combat this, but the best that I can do here is try to raise some awareness. If you want to listen to more true crime stories, listen to the podcast Murder in America that I co-host with my wife, Courtney. It's available on all streaming platforms. Like, everybody has seen this shit. First of all, they're f***ing crazy expensive, right? Oh, I know what the fuck you're talking about. The Apple f***ing goggles, right? Uh, Apple Vision Pro. I've seen a lot of people, you know, getting it them, and stuff, and them. it just looks like, Ready to play one bro, one? what's next? I've seen people display what they were looking in the goggles, and motherfucker, they were doing simulations, and that shit looked real. It's like extra dopamine. If you're constantly seeing beautiful things, bro, everything else that's normal is gonna seem whack. Yo, this is off topic, but imagine the crazy shit that people are gonna be doing just with or AI girlfriends. That's the thing I'm gonna get into right now. I have two things that I want you to see. I was wondering if you would like to have you. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. What's his nickname? The Italian Stallion. <laughs> they have sex like this. <laughs> Yo, what the f So everything was neuro-linked. Imagine that, bro. I'm pretty sure we're closer to that than what we think. Yo, what the f Like a drug addict. Hit hey, with his eye. And Bitcoin. This girl went missing in 2019, only to be found alive three years later inside a staircase. Paisley's parents lost custody of her and her sister, and in 2019, on the day that they were supposed to be handed over to a legal guardian, Paisley mysteriously went missing while her sister was at school. Her parents, Kim and Kirk, had fled to Kirk's father's house, presumably with Paisley. When police arrived to search the house, Paisley was nowhere to be seen and her parents said they had absolutely no idea where she was. The house was searched multiple times but Paisley remained missing. Then in early 2022 police received an anonymous tip-off saying that Paisley was definitely in that house. They went to search it again and they spent four hours searching for Paisley. She was still nowhere to be seen. But when they searched the basement, they actually found a bedroom. The bed looks slept in and the name Paisley was written on the wall. One officer then noticed something strange about the staircase to the basement. He said he had a gut feeling and when he shone his torch behind the stairs, he saw a blanket. He decided to rip one of the steps out and he saw two little feet. They were Paisley's and she was discovered in this crawl space inside the staircase. Police had been in that house four hours searching for Paisley. They'd walked up and down that staircase multiple times and she'd stayed silent the whole time. She didn't even say a word when they rescued her. Kirk, Kim and Kirk's father were all arrested. Annoyingly, I cannot find anything about their charges or trials, but I did find an article from July 2023 stating that Paisley and her sister were returned to the custody of their mother, Kim. Because fuck you, that's why. 
The TikToker I just showed you is allegedly a pedophile and a murderer, and he murdered a toddler just last year. This is Tanner Horner, a former FedEx driver, and on social media, he appeared to be the most normal guy you could imagine. Tanner was always posting photos in goofy hats, cracking little jokes, making meaningless TikToks about his work life at FedEx and his life in general. But in December of 2022, he would commit one of the most atrocious acts you can imagine. On that day, he was out doing deliveries and he delivered a Christmas present, a package of Barbie dolls to the home of a seven-year-old girl named Athena Strand. Now, like I said, Athena was only seven years old on the day that she died. And according to Tanner, on that day, Athena was out in the street playing when he accidentally struck her with his FedEx truck. Now, he went to the girl, he was saying he's sorry, he didn't mean to hurt her, but when she woke up from her state of unconsciousness and told Tanner that she was gonna tell her father what had happened, he then proceeded to murder her with his bare hands. Tanner then hid the body in town and went on with his day. Shortly afterwards, though, he was arrested after witnesses placed him at the scene of the crime. And two days after he was arrested, he led the authorities right to the location of seven-year-old Athena's body. Now, this story is incredibly disturbing, not only because the TikTok video I showed you that he posted at the very beginning shows him in his FedEx uniform at the FedEx workplace, but Tanner Horner is also allegedly a pedophile. You see, he's being held in prison right now on murder charges, but he's also being held for four charges of SA against a child that stem back to 2013, four charges. So this guy is obviously a scumbag. I know there's a lot more to the story that we're gonna find out about soon, but since there's been no trial and no verdict, the details are still pretty slim, but I will update y'all once we learn more about this horrific crime. The unusual way this woman was found makes her death one of the most confusing and unsettling of all time. It was 1951 in St. Petersburg, Florida. It was the 2nd of July and a woman named Pansy Carpenter was trying to deliver something to one of her tenants. However, her tenant wasn't answering the door. This was Mary Reesa, a 67-year-old widow. Now, Pansy was obviously concerned about this and she knew something was really wrong when she felt the door handle and felt it was really, really hot. She contacted police and never imagining in a million years what they would find. Mary's charred remains lay across the room. Her entire body had been cremated apart from part of her skull and one foot. Bizarrely, the foot still had a slipper on and was relatively unharmed. What made this discovery even more unusual was despite the fact that somebody had literally been cremated in this apartment, the rest of the apartment seemed relatively normal. Scientists claimed that it would have taken three or four hours of constant burning at around 2,500 degrees to reach the level of cremation that was apparent here. Puzzlingly though, there was even a pile of obviously flammable newspapers really close to where Mary's remains were. The case caused members of the public and professionals to be completely stumped. Some believe that Mary spontaneously combusted. Now, this is when someone just randomly sets on fire due to something internally. However, the FBI argued against this theory. They said that she must have been smoking and set herself on fire by accident. But that still doesn't explain the extent of the burning and the lack of fire damage at the other areas of the apartment. One experienced fire researcher stated that it wouldn't have been possible to cremate her to that extent without more of the apartment being burned, especially those newspapers. Mary's death is considered one of the most unusual of all time. Like I'm dead, you killed me, I'm dead now. Shut up, Deku! Oh. This is TikToker Claire Miller, and in 2021, she stabbed her sister to death. So back in 2021, Claire Miller was your average 14-year-old girl. She was normal, she went to school, she had friends, and she posted a lot of videos on TikTok where she accrued a small fan base. There are even still pages to this day devoted to reposting her old TikToks and sharing them. But Claire had a dark side that nobody ever noticed, and that dark side would lash out in the worst imaginable way in 2021. So, Claire had an older sister named Helen. She was 19, Claire was 14, and sadly, Helen had cerebral palsy, which, as you know, is a debilitating disease. But for some reason, on February 2nd, 2021, Claire snapped. She grabbed a knife inside of her house and stabbed her 19-year-old sister, Helen, in the neck. 
Claire then called the police to turn herself in and was hysterical on the phone, claiming, I killed my sister, you need to come here now. And when authorities arrived at her house, Claire was standing out front, she was covered in blood, there was blood in the snow, and her sister was found inside of the home with a knife still inside of her neck. Authorities have gone on the record after this murder and stated how this case is so unusual because it was a sister murdering her older sister, and Claire was so young when she committed this crime, she was only 14 years old. Now, obviously, Claire's parents were horrified to find out that this had happened. They not only lost one of their daughters, but they lost their other daughter, too, because she was then arrested. And even though her attorneys tried to get this case moved to juvenile court, that motion was denied. And even though after her trial was found that Claire was mentally ill, she was sentenced to 12 and a half years to 40 years in prison after a third degree murder conviction. This story, once again, just goes to show that you can't ever really tell who a person is based on what they post on social media, because you could never tell by Claire's post that she was about to murder her own sister. I mean, just take a look at this final video. Christmas Eve 1999, Tara Tracy was brutally murdered while at work. But was not the result of a robbery or a possible planned murder? Tara was 25 years old and a mom of four. That day, she had just celebrated her son's seventh birthday and then she headed into work the overnight shift alone at the Pantry Convenience Store in Castlehane, North Carolina. Tara actually lived directly across the street from the store, so she usually felt pretty safe working alone at night with her husband so close. At around 3.15 a.m., a family friend saw Tara alive and well in the store. But not even an hour later, a local bread delivery man made a gruesome discovery. The cash register was tipped over and laying on the floor with some money taken out. And then the man saw Tara on the floor behind the counter, covered in blood. She had been beaten and stabbed multiple times in the head, chest, and torso. She was actually still alive when 911 was called, but she sadly later died at the hospital. Authorities found that Tara had major defensive wounds and had really fought for her life. Police never publicly stated what the murder weapon was, but they did say that it was unique and not something that you see every day. And also that it's not something typically used in a regular robbery. Since there were no security cameras in or around the store, Tara's case soon went cold. And sadly, just 17 months later on Memorial Day, her sister would also be killed, but this time by a drunk driver. But then several years later, something really odd happened. A woman named Anne walked into a chiropractic clinic where Tara's aunt worked. Anne told her that the two didn't know each other, but that she knew about Tara and that she could speak to her, and also that she was in the room with them. Anne proceeded to tell Tara's aunt about a specific Winnie the Pooh bear that Tara was buried with. She said that Tara told her where she was stabbed and described the serrated edge of the murder weapon that the killer used, which was only information known to authorities. Tara reportedly told Anne that she saw the face of her killer, which prompted Anne to draw a sketch of the man. He had marks on his face, letters tattooed on his fingers, and the word cowboy tattooed on his hands. Tara's family asked her to go to authorities with this information, which she did. And once there, Anne was looking through mugshots of local known criminals, and on the last page was a man that fit the description to a T. And he had actually been arrested before for attacking another woman. Unfortunately though, this information led to nowhere, and 23 years later, Tara's murder remains unsolved. This 18-year-old killed a mother and her daughter while street racing. So this is Cameron Heron. You probably know his story by now. In 2018, he was just a normal 18-year-old kid. At the time of the accident, Cameron was producing content for YouTube, was going to school, and on the day of the crash, he decided that he and his brother Tristan were going to race. So Cameron had a lifelong love of cars, and so he and his brother would always race, and he and his friends would race. But on that day, he reached a speed of 162 miles an hour in his car, and that's when he careened into Jessica and Lilia, a mother and daughter who were crossing the street. Jessica was actually wheeling her daughter across the street when Cameron struck them both with his vehicle. So tragically, on that day, David, Jessica's husband and Lilia's father, was driving home from work when he passed by a huge accident. He said to himself, wow, that must have been a bad accident. He went home, but when he got home, he noticed that his wife and daughter weren't there. So he got back in his vehicle, went out searching for them, and when he returned and passed by the scene of that accident, he noticed the stroller that was sitting on the side of the road. He recognized that that stroller belonged to his family. They owned one just like that. And shortly afterwards, he discovered that the victims of that horrific crash were his own wife and daughter, who were now dead. So Cameron was obviously arrested. He was eventually sentenced to 24 years in prison. And shockingly, afterwards, people have made thirst accounts dedicated to Cameron. 
the actual hashtag Cameron Heron on TikTok itself has billions of views, billions of views. And people have been idolizing this guy. His own parents have said in news articles that they get calls at all times of the day to their home from people from countries all over the world, specifically a lot of people from the Middle East calling to see how their son is doing. But yeah, this is just a tragic story all around. David lost his wife and daughter, his entire family, due to one idiot's reckless decision to go 162 miles an hour down a normal road. And in prison, Cameron Heron is going to be there for a very long time. So his entire adult life is pretty much gone, vanished before he could even be, you know, the legal age to drink an alcoholic drink. The clip I just showed you was from the final video that Jacob Cockle ever recorded. Jacob was a famous surfer, a social media presence, a nature photographer. He did a lot and he was a beloved figure in England. Before his death, Jacob's videos had garnered hundreds of thousands, millions of views on social media. And he was known not only for his love of the sea and his breathtaking photography, but for engaging in high-risk stunts. Stunts where he surfed over rocks or towards cliffs. Stunts where he jumped off of high buildings into the water below. And by his early 20s, Jacob had earned awards from places like National Geographic. He really was a beloved figure. But on May 28, 2013, Jacob's life would come to an extremely unfortunate end. On that day, a whirlpool appeared in Hale Harbor in England. This whirlpool would appear randomly in this harbor, and in the past, Jacob took tons of videos and photos of it and even swam in it. But on May 28, 2013, when Jacob jumped into the whirlpool wearing a horse mask, he had no idea of what was about to happen. In the footage, Jacob can be seen whirling around the whirlpool while his friend films him. They're talking about how it was stronger earlier, how it's a little scary right now, but it's nothing they can't handle. And at one point, Jacob swims out of the whirlpool, he grabs his GoPro, and he decides to get one shot of the nature event from underwater. Jacob then dives underwater and begins filming the whirlpool. This footage is all on YouTube. As he approaches the whirlpool, viewers notice that it's very strong, but it doesn't really look like something he can't handle, especially given the fact that he'd swam in similar circumstances many, many times. But at one point in the footage, Jacob seems to lose control and the camera work starts going all over the place. And back on the surface, Jacob's friend noticed that he went underwater, but he never came back up. Jacob's friend then frantically began to shout his name, searching for his body, but he saw no sign of Jacob anywhere. The whirlpool flowed through a tunnel into a pool, and Jacob's friend David then ran over there and started asking fishermen if they'd seen his friend. They all said no, they hadn't. Eventually, though, David saw Jacob in the pool. He was face down in the water, and he knew it was already too late. During his swim into the whirlpool, Jacob's wetsuit lost its buoyancy, which was something that Jacob didn't really account for, and that's what ended up helping him get sucked down into the whirlpool. After his death, Jacob was celebrated across the world, but I do have to say the footage of this incident is extremely chilling. If you want to hear more true crime stories, listen to the podcast that I co-host with my wife, Murder in America, available on all streaming platforms. This OF model allegedly murdered her boyfriend in 2022. This is the story of Courtney Clinton. So before all of this went down, Courtney was a famous model on the internet, if you know what I mean. She had a large OF page and she frequently posted her travels around the world funded by her own endeavors online. She was also really into fitness and entered a lot of fitness competitions in the past. So at the time of this murder, Courtney had about 2 million followers on Instagram, like she was a full-on famous influencer. And at some point in her journey, Courtney met this guy, Christian Obenselli. They started dating and it seemed like they had a really good relationship from the outside if you were somebody to just follow their social media. But friends and family knew there was a darkness lurking beneath the surface of the couple. They were fighting, they were always, you know, doing things to each other. And this would all come to a head in April of 2022. So initially, when the police were called to the couple's apartment in April of 2022, they found Courtney in there covered in her boyfriend's blood, holding his bloody body. This is how her hands looked upon her arrest. And yeah, she was obviously very distraught, but she initially claimed that she had stabbed her boyfriend in self-defense. And this is the angle that Courtney's lawyers have been going for the entire time since her arrest, that because of their relationship and the domestic violence that was happening in the relationship, Courtney had to stab her boyfriend because he had been attacking her that night. 
But then, when the charges were announced against Courtney, prosecutors released this damning video from the elevator in their apartment complex, which clearly shows Courtney beating the hell out of her boyfriend, Christian. I mean, that full video is online, and it is very clear that Christian is trying to de-escalate the situation, and Courtney will not let whatever's happening go, and is just wailing on him. Now, Courtney's lawyers in preparing for the trial have said that they've identified a couple of times when police have been involved in the disputes between the couple, and they claim that it's going to show that Christian was an aggressor towards Courtney. But Christian's family and attorneys obviously are claiming that Christian was the victim here of domestic violence. And on that day, when Courtney stabbed him in the chest and sliced open one of his arteries, which caused him to die, she was the only one attacking anybody in the apartment. So I'm really curious to see how this trial is going to pan out. And when we get some sort of an update on this, I will be sure to let you guys know what's happening. This is the most disturbing cartel murder ever. And this is the trigger warning. Maria Fernanda Garcia Alvarez was a 16 year old girl who was executed by some drug cartel members on suspicion of investigating against them. She was missing since July 15th, 2021. And a few months later, a gruesome video of her execution began circulating on gore sites and Reddit. The video is two minutes and 31 seconds long and the setting looks like some sort of forest or some trail in the woods near a forest. When the video starts, Maria is on her knees with her hands tied behind her back. She is wearing jeans and a white blouse shirt. And the look on her face will keep you up at night. She is surrounded by at least three gang members, the cameraman, the one holding a gun against her head, and the other holding a pretty long knife against her throat. The opening 50 seconds is your usual cartel interrogation. The interrogation is translated to, interrogator demands her name. She replies, Maria Fernanda Garcia Alvarez. The interrogator then asked, who was the person who ordered you to infiltrate us? Maria replies, Fernando Mendoza. The interrogator then asked, who planned all the stuff you're doing? She says Fernando and Francisco. The interrogator then says, tell us the people who infiltrated us. Give us nicknames. She replies Oscar and then another name that can't be made out. Finally, he asked, who did you report to on everything we did? Maria said, Fernando Mendoza. The killer then ends the negotiation by saying, now you'll see why you don't want to play with us. As the video plays out, it is extremely hard to watch. Maria is panic breathing and on the verge of tears. Her killer then proceeds to cut into her throat while holding his hand over her mouth and bringing the knife back and forth like a saw. And while watching, you can instantly tell the knife isn't sharp enough to cut clean through a neck which makes this 100 times worse for Maria. Maria is screaming and screaming while crying hysterically. The sound of this is horrific and will keep you up at night. Eventually, the knife gets through the skin and into her throat. And at this point, Maria's screams change pitch dramatically. She tries to struggle, but the other man holds her in place. Her screams get deeper as the killer continues to cut and cut and cut. For a split second, she manages to move her head, which frees the killer's hand from her mouth. She then lets out a desperately loud scream that you wish you've never heard. The killer then regains control and puts his hand back over her mouth and continues cutting. She is still screaming after a minute of having her throat cut. At this point, it seems like the killer is losing his composure, I would say, for Maria's screams, and then takes the tip of the knife and puts it into her throat and pushes it down with his palm, right into Maria's windpipe, and at this point, her screams change in pitch again. You almost hear the scream and air leave her throat. The killer then moves the knife side to side to try and make the wound bigger, and after all this, Maria is still conscious. The killer then proceeds to stab Maria in the stomach a couple times, and seems desperate to get the job done. And it's extremely apparent that this is his first time doing anything like this. He then proceeds cutting her throat and stabs the knife again into her body. At this point, Maria's body then goes limp. The killer then looks at the camera and throws up the peace sign, and the video ends. This is truly one of the most sickening cases I've ever researched, and it's a shame stuff like this happens daily. I beg you to never go searching for this video because it's really sickening and sad and it will honestly just ruin your day or might even ruin weeks of your life. This guy is one of the most awful serial killers there has ever been and I feel like he's never talked about. In my opinion, this guy's worse than Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer. Hi Meg, I talk about your crime. Let's get into the story of The Butcher, the worst serial killer Canada has ever seen. Robert Picton was born October 24th, 1949. 
in British Columbia, Canada. Robert had quite a bad upbringing. His dad was very abusive. He actually grew up on a pig farm. From a really young age, him and his brother had to work countless hours on this pig farm. And then they were forced to go straight to school without taking a shower or anything. Because he was showing up to school unwashed, Robert started getting bullied and they gave him the nickname Stinky Piggy. As Robert grew older, he was said to be very quiet, but he apparently sometimes had these weird bursts of bizarre behavior. These bursts would come out of nowhere and he would just start acting really strange. In 1996, Robert's brother opened up a kind of charity thing. The charity was started to try to make more money for their pig farm. It was called the Piggy Palace Good Times Society. And what they would do is they would hold huge parties and raves to try and raise money. And I'm not joking when I say huge parties and raves. 17,000 people were said to have shown up at one point. 17,000 people at once. Sex workers and biker gangs would join these parties as well. But for Robert, it all started going downhill in 1997 when he attempted to murder a girl. I don't usually do this in these videos, but a lot of you ask what blush I use, and this is the blush I use. It's usually 10 pounds on the TikTok shop, but it's on for Fiverr right now. So if you click right here, you can get it. I just ordered kind of a peachy version of this. I'm not being paid to talk about this. I just saw they were on offer, and you guys ask about these all the time. So get your hands on them for cheap while you can. So Robert attempts to murder a woman for the first time that we know of. According to her statement, he attempted to handcuff her and then he started stabbing her multiple times before she managed to get away. This should have been the thing that got him on police radar, but he was able to get the charges dropped because the woman he attacked was on a lot of drugs at the time and Robert used that to come up with a story. He told police like she was hitchhiking, I was just trying to help her and she attacked me and they believed him because she was on drugs. And unfortunately, for the next 60 women he would kill, he was let go. And he was able to come up with a strategy that wouldn't get him caught next time. He developed a plan and started killing a bunch of women. And Robert was really, really good at staying under the radar. Now, what did he do exactly? Let me tell you. Because it's just, it's disturbing. First of all, he always went for hitchhikers, addicts, or prostitutes. And what he would do is he would promise them money, drugs, accommodation, anything to get them back to his farm. Once he got them back, he would then shoot or strangle them to death. And this next part is why he was given the name the Butcher. He would take the victims' bodies, chop them up, and feed them to his pigs. Now, if you're not aware of this already, pigs will literally eat anything, everything. So the evidence was just, bye. They were getting rid of the evidence for him. All of a sudden, there is an increase in missing women in the area. But sadly, because he only went after sex workers or addicts or hitchhikers, no one cared. And this always makes me so mad with cases like these, like they're still human beings, but no bodies were showing up, so there was no crime, no body, no crime. But as the numbers started rising, people were kind of getting a bit worried. A group of people that weren't the police actually got a list together of all of the names of these young women who were missing. They brought that to the police and were like, do you see now? And that's when the investigation actually began into finding out what happened to these girls. And all of these girls had one person in common, Robert Picton. He was the only person whose name continuously came up when they were looking for these girls. Police needed a way to get onto the farm with a warrant without him knowing about it and hiding all the evidence first. And so they heard that he had possession of an illegal firearm. And so they used that as the cover-up to get onto his property. On the property, they found multiple items that belonged to these missing women, along with some blood-stained clothing and tiny bone fragments. Now, things aren't looking too good for Robert, but because the pigs had eaten all the evidence, basically all of it, they were only able to charge him with the murder of six women. 
and so he got six counts of murder. When he got arrested, he actually said that he killed 49 women and that he was sad that he didn't get to round up to 50. What the hell, Robert? What does he want the police officer to say like, oh, I feel so bad for you. No! He was arrested in 2002 and this trial was huge. Of course, he was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. But guys, that's not the worst part of this story because I'm getting to that now. One element of the story that I kept out until now is that Robert... <laughs> Robert sold the meat of his pigs to people who lived around the area. These pigs who ate the remains of 60 women were sold to his neighbors. When I say neighbors, I just mean people who live in the area. So like secondhand, cam can secondhand cannibalism. I could never eat pig again if that was me. So yeah, they were pretty um, disturbed and freaked out by this information, which is uh, totally understandable and just totally disgusting. After a huge search of his property, police now believe that the number of women Robert killed was in the 60s. 60 women. 60 mother, daughters, wives. It's insane. It really annoys me with cases like these. I know it was like in 2002 and things have changed, but have they? I find that a lot of cases like these that I cover always start with, oh, all these women were going missing, but they were sex workers, but they were drug addicts, who cares? And it's like, it's insane to me that like, they're not seen as equals to any other woman walking on the street, but whatever, hopefully that changes. And for those wondering, I have actually covered this story before, but the quality of the video was so, so bad that I just, I couldn't keep it up anymore. Like, it really bothered me to watch back, so I thought I would remake it in a higher quality way. I hope you guys enjoyed it regardless, and have a wonderful day. My heart goes out to every single one of the victims, their families, and people who cared about them, um, and I hope Robert rots in jail. Anyways. This is not a good representation of Canadians. We're actually really nice people. I'll see you all in the next video. Love you guys. Bye. However, according to the phrase, you can't make this stuff up. Like have known the story of real-life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair. No one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic, child, murderer, and cannibal. Killer accidentally admitted to his crimes by accident when he forgot he was wearing a microphone while taking part in a documentary. This is how a true crime documentary exposed a killer. In 1971, Robert Durst met Kathleen McCormack and they got married. At the time of her disappearance in 1982, Kathleen had nearly graduated college. She was last seen by a witness at a dinner party where she appeared to be upset. She got a call from Robert and left. Robert admitted to having argued with Kathleen that night, but he said he put her on a train to New York and then never saw her again. Her friend called police to report her missing. Interestingly, Kathleen had been treated at a medical centre for facial bruises weeks prior to this and told the friend that Robert had done it. Robert had actually been dating someone else for some time prior to this and had been living separately to Kathleen. When her family broke into her cottage to try and find out where she was, they found the place had been trashed and her possessions put in the bin. Kathleen's family always believed that Robert was involved in her disappearance. In 2000, Susan Berman, a friend of Robert's, was found murdered. Now, she'd actually provided Robert with an alibi for Kathleen's disappearance. Now, pay really close attention to this next bit. Days after she was killed, a letter addressed to the Beverly Hills Police Department contained Susan's address and the word cadaver on it. On the envelope, Beverly was misspelled. Robert admitted in 2005 that Susan had called him shortly before her death to say that the police wanted to question her about Kathleen going missing. It's believed that Robert killed Susan to keep her quiet. In 2001, Robert's neighbour's body parts were found floating in Galveston Bay. Robert's elderly neighbour, Morris Black, had been killed and Robert was arrested. He was actually released on bail and fled and was found about a month later in Pennsylvania. He was found with $37,000 cash, two weapons, and interestingly, Morris Black's driving license. In court, Robert claimed he was acting in self-defense. He said he'd accidentally shot Morris and dismembered his body. Due to lack of forensics, he only got five years in jail. This is where things get really crazy. HBO was filming a documentary called The Jinx. During production, Susan's stepson found a letter written by Robert. 
This contained the same spelling error in the word Beverly as the anonymous letter to police. This implicated Robert in the murder. Now, while filming the documentary, Robert needed the toilet. He forgot that he had a microphone still attached to him. He was recorded talking to himself. He said, there it is, you're caught. You're right, of course, but you can't imagine. Arrest him. And then he said, what a disaster. He was right, I was wrong. And finally he said, I'm having difficulty with the question. What the hell did I do? Killed them all, of course. This is Peter Scully, one of the worst pedophiles in world history. I'm about to tell you his story, but seriously guys, this one is incredibly disturbing. It's so dark and viewer discretion is really advised for this video. So Peter Scully, he's still alive. He was from Australia. He had a family there, but he was engaging in criminal activities and he eventually fled the country and moved to the Philippines. And this is where the darkness really began. While he was in Australia, Peter Scully started up a international child sex abuse ring. The things that were done to these kids are, I mean, I can't even talk about them here on TikTok, but he also started up a pay-per-view video service. And with these videos, he was producing CP, but one of the most extreme forms of CP that can possibly be produced. So how did all this happen? Well, when he was out living in the Philippines, Peter Scully had two Filipina girlfriends. They would go out to the streets. They would find kids that needed money or looked impoverished. They would bring them back to the house they shared with Peter. And the things that went on afterwards are literally unspeakable. Remember, like I mentioned before, Peter was the head of an international ring of people that enjoyed the abuse of kids. And he provided videos for these clients but his most infamous video was titled Daisy's Destruction. This video that he produced was so extreme, so hardcore that people on the internet, when they heard about what happened in the video, literally thought that it was an urban legend and they thought that there was no way this could be real. This is an actual screenshot of the beginning of the video. This is a screenshot from the very beginning of the video. In the video, um, three young girls are repeatedly tortured for hours and hours on end by Peter Scully and his two girlfriends from the Philippines. They are beaten, they are sexually abused. I mean, I can't even describe, like I said on TikTok, some of the things that happened in this video. And 18 month old Daisy. Now keep in mind that all of this was on camera. That's the most disturbing part of this. Um, one of Peter's victims actually ended up dying. They, they were buried in his house. And this sick, sick individual literally sold that video footage across the world. And what's even more disturbing is that there were lots of people willing to pay to see that video. I'm not kidding. People were paying $10,000 to view this video. That is absolute insanity that there are people that sick out there in the world. And this is only the beginning of the crimes that this guy carried out. Some of the other stuff that we're going to touch on is absolutely disgusting. It's absolutely, it's just horrific. And the story of how Peter Scully was eventually identified and arrested is extremely captivating. I'm going to run out of time here on this video, but if you want to see a part two, let me know below. The story is far from over. I spent a weekend with one of the most notorious killers in Texas. So in my early 20s, I spent a lot of time in South Texas in women's prisons units, helping people find forgiveness and second chances at life. And on this one particular weekend, when we arrived, the correctional officers informed our team that there was a new inmate on the premises. She was only 17 years old and had been tried and convicted as an adult for a very violent crime. And because I was the youngest person on our prison team, they voted me to be the one to work with her because she was young, I was young, and she might relate to me and open up to me. Now, I had a rule for myself when I worked with these women to never look up their crimes. I didn't want it to affect my judgment about them or to affect my willingness to help them, so that was just a rule that I always kept. So the correctional officers, they walked me down this long corridor into a classroom where sitting at the table was Erin Caffey. Now, Erin Caffey is a tiny, tiny thing. Now, I'm a tiny person, and I dwarfed her. She's very small, very timid, very soft-spoken, rarely will look you in the eye. And my first thought whenever I lay eyes on her and I sit down across from her is, how can somebody this small and this timid possibly be convicted as an adult for a violent crime? What violence is she possibly capable of? Little did I know. We, we started talking and we kind of started to get to know each other a little bit, cracked a few jokes. I tried to get her to lighten up and eventually she did start kind of opening up to me and she started volunteering uh, some details about her version of what had happened the night of her crime. 
And I have to admit, you know, even though I had a rule to really try not to know what people had done, I was very curious because, again, here's this tiny little thing. She's 17 years old, looks scared to death, and she's in this facility. And, well, her version of the events that took place the night of the crime led me to believe that she was a victim in all of it and that it was really out of her hands. She couldn't stop it, and she's haunted by it, regrets it every day of her life, and she just wishes she could take it all back. And y'all, she was so convincing, just absolutely convincing, that I truly believed that she was innocent. She had somehow gotten mixed up with the wrong crowd, was wrongly convicted. And I started brainstorming in my head, like, how can I raise awareness about this and help her get out? Little did I know in my naivety that this young lady was a psychopath. She was very cunning, very manipulative, and the small, mousy, timid, soft-spoken thing was very much a calculated tactic to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. And my time with her started a long season of my life of panic attacks and nightmares. And I'm gonna tell you more about that in part two. This 23-year-old TikToker has just been found guilty of murder. This story is just insane, so hi, I'm Meg, I talk about true crime, let's get into it. At the time of the crime, Mahek Buhari was 23 years old. She had nearly 130,000 TikTok followers, 45,000 on Instagram, and thousands on YouTube as well. She made videos on makeup, lifestyle, fashion, stuff like that. And she was beginning to make a name for herself on multiple platforms. Her mother featured in a few of her videos and they seemed to be really close. Her mother's name was Ansreen and she is 46 years old. This whole situation began around three years ago when her mother started a secret affair with a younger man. The man's name was Saqib and he was only 19 I believe when this affair started and she was like in her 40s. He quickly fell in love with Ansreen, sorry if I'm saying any of these names wrong, they're kind of difficult for me to pronounce, but she was married and to her this was just like a fun little affair on the side. She had been married to her husband for over 20 years and he did not know about this affair. The only person who knew about the affair was Mahek, the TikToker. Saqib really wanted a real relationship and he wanted to woo her, so he spent thousands on her. It said somewhere that he spent around 2,000 pounds trying to impress her. Fast forward to 2022, and Serene wanted to end this relationship. He was getting pretty obsessed with her, so she just wanted nothing to do with it anymore. After she tried ending things, things got pretty intense really quick. Saqib started threatening her because he had certain videos and pictures of them together, if you know what I mean. He was blackmailing her being like, if you leave me, I will send these to your son and your husband. And obviously she did not want these intimate moments being shown to her son. And she did not want her husband finding out either because that would be bad. Like I said before, Mahek was the only person who knew about this affair, so her mother turned to her for help. She turned to her 23-year-old daughter. The two spoke about it over WhatsApp, which is just mistake number one. If you're gonna try to like take someone out, you know, call about it, don't text it. There's a text from Mahek to her mother saying, I'll soon get him jumped by guys and he won't know what day it is. So it doesn't necessarily mention murder, but it does, you know, prove that she wanted to do something. Mahek, alongside her mother, decided to arrange a meeting with Saqib to give him back the two grand he spent on Ansreen. 11th of February 2022, the police get a frantic phone call from Saqib. Here's a transcript of the call if you want to fully read it. You can pause now. <sighs> TikTok just deleted the other half of this video and I've just finished the makeup, so I'm just going to continue the story. In this phone call, Saqib is frantically trying to get the police to help him because he's being followed very closely. And he claimed in the phone call that the people following him were wearing balaclavas, which are like masks kind of and he says 
They're trying to ram me off the road. They're trying to kill me. I'm going to die. He was not alone in the car. He was with his friend, his childhood friend called Mohammed. As the police were trying to get him some help, the phone call ended after he screamed and there was a huge crashing noise. Saqib's car was rammed off the road by another car off of the A64 dual carriageway. The car immediately was engulfed in flames and both the young men lost their lives. All because a woman didn't want her husband to know that she was cheating on him. Well, he knows now because the police obviously found out about it. The bodies were so badly burnt that they had to be identified using dental records. It was pretty clear that this wasn't an accident because of the 999 call he made earlier. Just so you guys know, this is in England. I feel like I've not mentioned that yet. I'm not really sure how the police actually found out who was involved. Like that whole part was not anywhere that I could personally find. But they ended up at Mahek's house and she claimed that she was home all evening. She later then changed her story saying that she had been there but she wasn't involved at all. In fact, in this video footage you're seeing right now, her car was the one with the red arrow. And her mother, and Serene, was also there with her. The police confiscated Mahek's phone and asked for the password and she gave them the wrong password, which is like sketchy as hell. When they asked her why she gave them the wrong code, she was like, oh, I was stressed out and gave you the wrong code, but it's really because she probably didn't want them reading the text messages saying she was going to get Saqib jumped. Mahek actually said in court that she had lied to the police multiple times, but her, alongside everybody else involved, were claiming that they were innocent, that they had nothing really to do with it, it was all an accident. But after the trial, they were all found to be guilty. Every single one of the drivers involved. I think that there was one that was let go, but I don't actually really know the situation behind that because the information is not very good at the moment because it's all very new, so it's kind of hard to find what I need. I don't think that the sentencing has been done yet because I can't actually find a number of years that her and her mother and everyone involved will be in prison for, but they're definitely going to prison. I think I read somewhere that the sentencing will be done in September, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that information. Like I said, it's very scarce. And that's the entire case from what I could find and saying to me that those two young men lost their lives because of this. Like, it's so ridiculous. It's creepy because her TikTok account is still, like, up. And it's weird to look at, like, her videos. She probably had no idea that her last video was going to be her last video. I would love to hear what you guys have to say about this case slash what case you want me to do next. I'm so mad that TikTok deleted that half of the video because the actual process was really cool into doing this makeup. But I hope that you guys still enjoyed the video regardless. Um, I'm a little angry about it. When you're watching this video, I will be on a plane. I'm going to Canada for three weeks to visit some family. I have pre-recorded some videos, so you will still have your true crime, don't worry. If I have a free day, I will definitely film another true crime video while I'm in Canada, but that really depends on like what I'm doing every day. It would be kind of cool to do it in like a different setup. I don't know. I am literally filming the pre-recorded videos after this one. So I'm literally going to have to take off my makeup, film the other video, take off my makeup, film the other video. And it's my skin is not going to be happy. That's everything for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.